Are you happy with the format? I'm very happy Ready with the format. Ready for the first format. question? Yes, excited Here we go. To Let's start with our first question, and that is Diana, who's here on the front row. Good evening, Diana. What's your Good question evening. for Ms Trust? My question for Liz is, the Bank of England have said that a recession is inevitable. What could you do to Im mitigate the impact of this? Well, what the Bank of England have said today is, of course, extremely worrying. But it is not inevitable. We can change the outcome and we can make it more likely that the economy grows. And what's important is, first of all, that we need to help people struggling with the cost of living. I would immediately reverse the national insurance increase. I would also have a temporary moratorium on the green energy level to save people money on fuel bills. But I'd also keep corporate, corporation tax low to make sure that we are attracting investment into our economy and doing all we can to avoid a recession. Because I know what it's like when people lose their jobs, when towns and cities across our country struggle. I don't want our country to go through that. That's why it's so important we keep taxes low and we do all we can to grow the economy by taking advantage of our post-Brexit freedom, unleashing investment, changing things like the procurement rules and doing things differently. But now is the time to be bold, because if we don't act now, we are headed for very, very difficult times. Are you happy with that? I am, that's good to hear, thank okay, you. OK, anybody else got to follow up on that one for us? Nobody at this stage, we're just warming you up still, aren't we? <laughs> OK, well, I've got one. Are you all confident that you'll be able to avert a recession by the end of the year? Well, what we know at the moment is a recession is predicted by the Bank of England. And what we need to make sure is we're using all the tools at our disposal, keeping taxes low, doing the reforms we need to to our economy to get growth going faster, to encourage people to set up businesses, to encourage businesses to invest. And I want us to be on the side of people who work hard, people who do the right thing, people who support their families, people who set up businesses. And that's why it's so important we don't burden them with excess regulation, but that we also keep taxes low. Under the current proposals, our corporation tax would go up to the same level as France and 10 points ahead of Ireland. And I really worry about our capacity to attract that investment into our economy if we do that. Okay. You simply can't tax your way to growth. And I'm afraid the very high taxes we have at the moment, a 70-year high, are likely to lead to a recession. Okay. And that's what the Bank of England is predicting. OK, Neha is here. Neha, good evening to you. What's good your question evening. for Ms Truss? Uh, hi, Liz. My hi. question is, I'm amongst very few in my age group and ethnicity that are actually members of the Conservative Party. I've been speaking to some of us and we are afraid that the party has lost credibility. So my question is, how will you repair the damage to the party's reputation? Well, the most important thing is we deliver on the promises we made. We got elected across the country in 2019. Because of our manifesto, we said we'd unleash opportunity, that we would grow the economy, that we would keep taxes low. So we need to deliver on all of those things. We need to deliver on the opportunities of Brexit. And when we promise something, we need to follow through on it. I think that's really important. But I also want the Conservative Party to be a party that reaches out to everybody across the country, gets new people on board, encourages people to join our party because we've got some fantastically talented MPs, but we need a new generation of members. And I would appoint a really strong party chairman uh, to encourage that to happen. Any clues? I, I have not. I am definitely, <laughs> Kay, not being premature. Uh, we're still in the middle of a leadership race. And what I'm about is about talking to our party members about my policies for government. But what I can say is I would always make sure I appointed people to my cabinet on the basis of merit and people that get things done because what people really want us to do is deliver. And we've only got two years, it's not a long amount of time and we need to get started straight away. So I want people from all parts of the party, from all parts of the country, who can really get on and deliver. OK, uh, politicians always say that our party is a broad church and I always point out to them that people die in broad church. <laughs> I know. Uh, let's bring it... <laughs> no, I know, I know, that, I know. That, 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 that K is worse than the earlier pun. That is worse than the earlier pun. We'll keep that between ourselves. Uh, Nashava uh, has got a question for us. Hi. Just here. Hi. Good evening, Liz. I'm a medical consultant. Um, I work in a hospital and I see day in, day out the relentless pressure that our medical staff is having. Now, understaffing is a real issue at this moment in time. If you become the next Prime Minister, how will you solve this? 
Well, first of all, the NHS has done a fantastic job in COVID, but we are facing a huge backlog, and that is putting pe huge pressure on. First of all, I make sure we're putting the recent funding we allocated, the 13 billion, into social care, because there are many people who are in hospital who ought to be in social care, but there aren't the beds available. So I'd first of all make sure we're investing the money in social care. I'd also support our doctors and nurses more by removing some of the central diktats and also having fewer layers of management. I've, on the campaign trail over the last few weeks, I've met people who face seven or eight layers of management above them. And I think that can be quite difficult and quite demotivating. And what we need is more of the, uh, more of the empowerment, more of the decisions to be made by people on the front line. There are also a number of other issues we need to look at, like doctors' pensions. Mm -hmm. I've met a lot of doctors who've gone into retirement because of the specific issues around their pensions. I need to sort that out. And also, uh, there are many doctors who very kindly came out of retirement to help during COVID. You know, help with the vaccination programme, help with uh, the real issues we face in our hospitals. And what I'd like to do is see what we can do to encourage those people to come back into the profession and really help, because we do face serious issues. It is difficult to get a GP appointment. I represent a rural area. We've got real problems with ambulance waiting times as well. So we need all hands on deck, but I really believe that it's by trusting people on the front line, trusting the professionals more, and making the organisation a really great place to work, that we will actually solve these problems together. Want to come back on that? I will say that I know that uh, people that I work with will be really, really happy if you looked into pension tax because a lot of people are going into early retirement. Mm, exactly. So I'm sure that will help bring the waiting list down and, uh, um, you know, help the road for recovery as well. So thank you. Thank you. But, but we also need to listen to people like you who are actually involved in the health service and listen to your advice. Because what, what I've heard is lots of areas where we could use our facilities better. So, for example, I met a doctor who told me that he wanted to go in and work at the weekend, use the equipment at the weekend, but actually he'd been banned from more senior people in the organisation from doing that. So there are things like that that I think we can empower people to do things differently and really treat this as a major national programme to, to deal with the aftermath of COVID. Okay. We were very successful at dealing with COVID getting the vaccine, rolling out the vaccine, but now we have a, yeah. a major issue with the National Health Service and we need all of the best brains working on it. Just to clarify, are you suggesting that you should sack layers of management? No, I'm not. What I'm suggesting is that we need to deploy people in the National Health Service better. And what I have heard so keep them is that there's been, a lot of, there's been a lot of targets set centrally by the Department of Health and NHS England and I want things to be decided more locally. So there's less distance between the people making the decisions and the people actually on front okay. line Lots helping the patients. Lots of people want to ask you questions, Ms Truss. I think David from Guildford. David, where are you? Hand up, David. Where is he? There he is. He's just here. David, you've got a question on Ukraine, I believe. I have. I thought it was going to Rishi, I must admit. Oh, but, well. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, 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 I'm perfectly happy. There we happy. are. How would you propose to broker peace negotiations in Ukraine as opposed to continuing to provide arms to prolong the state of war? Well, the only way this war will end is when the Russians leave Ukraine. And we need to make sure that we enable the Ukrainians to defeat Vladimir Putin. If there's any failed peace settlement, if there's any giveaway of Ukrainian territory, what we know from history is Russia will just come back for more. We saw that with the Minsk Accords, which didn't work. And we know what Vladimir Putin's plans are. He said that he wants to create a greater Russia, essentially the old Soviet Union, including the likes of the Baltic states. So that is why it's so important that we were the first European country to supply weapons to Ukraine. And we need to continue to do that. But we also need to work with our allies like the Americans, who are also putting weapons into Ukraine. We also need to toughen up the sanctions on Russia, because at the moment, the way Putin is able to fund his appalling war machine is because of the oil and gas revenues that he's getting. And so that means us finding alternative sources, particularly in the UK, we, we have the North Sea, we can invest in more nuclear, but it also involves other countries finding alternative sources as well. Because what Putin has done 
is he's used Europe's dependence on Russian gas to hold the whole continent to ransom. And that is appalling. And we know the end result of what happens when dictators get appeased. Is that every inch of um, territory that's been taken since 2014? Well, I certainly think it would be wrong for us to give away any territory on behalf of the Ukrainians. Now, of course, President Zelensky you know, ultimately is the person who has to determine what an eventual peace deal would look like. And he has been very clear that Russia needs to leave the entirety of the Ukrainian territory. But I think it would be completely wrong for the United Kingdom or indeed any other country to say Ukraine should give up part of that, their territory. That would be very wrong. And what I worry is the lesson it would give to aggressors around the world if Russia was seen by sabre-rattling, by landing up, lining up troops on the border, lining up tanks on the border, then successfully gaining a piece of Ukrainian territory. Sure. What message would that send to others around the world? It would be a terrible message and the long-term threat to global Let's security like David would be quickly. appalling. David? No, I just wondered if you, you didn't mention anything uh, about attempting to negotiate or broker some peace deal. Well, the, uh, we have been involved in working on negotiations with our American, French and German colleagues, and we are providing support to the Ukrainians to do just that. But it is ultimately about what the Ukrainians are willing to negotiate. What I don't want to see is Ukraine be put under any pressure to give up territory for expediency's okay. sake, because I'm saying it simply won't be expedient, because all we'll see is Russia retreat and then come back for more later. And they still haven't given up their ambitions to take the whole of Ukraine. It was a tactical retreat away from Kiev, yeah. not a long-term retreat, and we need to be very, very worried about Putin's intentions. Mm. It's one of the reasons, by the way, that I favour raising our defence spending to 3% okay. of GDP over the next Still decade. Still got lots of questions to get through. Sorry. So if I may, no, not at all. <laughs> I want to bring in our next uh, question, which is about housing, and it's from Jude from Chippenham, and I've wanted to say this all evening. Hey, Jude. <laughs> uh. hey, hey, thank you very much. Um, hello, Foreign Secretary. I've recently graduated and will be moving to London to start a new job as a commercial lawyer. When I made the decision, I thought, perhaps naively, that it would make sense to buy somewhere in London rather than rent. But that was before I saw the cost of a deposit on a starter home. How will you solve the housing crisis and make it easier for young people to own their own home? Jude, I think it's incredibly important that we help more people get on the housing ladder. It is a problem that this generation of young people end up buying houses much later in their lives than previous generations. But the way to do it is not the system we have at the moment, which is Soviet-style top-down housing targets, which simply uh, cause huge concern and don't actually deliver the results we want. And I've, before I became an MP, I was a councillor, I sat on a planning committee. It was hours of my life I'll never get back <laughs> because, because we didn't have any control over what happened. Everything got overruled by the planning inspectorate in Bristol. So what I want is a much more localised system of planning. So in London, for example, I think there's more opportunity to build up uh, in London, uh, to build more you know, higher storey buildings. I think in other parts of the country, what we need is more investment zones where we have industry developed alongside homes, alongside infrastructure, and that can be determined by local people. But the one-size-fits-all planning system we have at the moment simply doesn't work. The other thing I do to help you specifically is when somebody does rent, they should be able to use their rental history towards getting a mortgage for their home. And that will help people who are long-term renters get onto the housing ladder. OK, just want to share this quote with you um, that you, uh, I think it was uh, three years ago, perhaps a little bit longer. We need to build a million homes on the London Green Belt, near railway stations and around other growing cities, specifically to allow the under 40s to be able to own their own homes. Do you still want to build a million homes on Green Belt and the like? So what I don't want to do, Kay, is build it on the Green Belt. Because Changed I do mind. think... Well, I've changed, I've changed my view on that. I'm still very keen for the under-40s to be able to own their own homes. 
But what I've seen is that the way these top-down targets have resulted in having the opposite effect of getting the homes built. And I'm now of the view that what we need to do is have okay. incentives to get local councils to set up investment zones and do things differently, because the current system isn't working. OK, so you've changed your mind on that one. Uh, Jill from Tunbridge Wells. Are you angry, Jill? <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> well, disgusted. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Liz. Um, Hi. How important is it to balance the books? So the answer is, it is important over the long term to make sure that the private sector is growing faster than the public sector and we are able to generate the revenues for our economy and also be able to pay for our public services. But it isn't right to try and balance the book straight away when we've had a major global crisis like COVID and every single country in the world has built up debts from that crisis. And in fact, we have lower levels of debt than most of the G7 countries. So I think trying to balance the books prematurely is actually counterproductive because if you put up taxes and you stop businesses forming, you stop new investment and you stop economic growth, you're less likely to be able to pay down the debt over the longer term. Happy with that? No. Doesn't look as though you no, are. Not so not what's your follow-up question um, on that one? Liz, I do not want to see my children and my grandchildren encumbered with huge debt at a time of rising interest rates, Bank of England today, and at a time of high inflation. The one thing Margaret Thatcher believed in was sound money. This is not sound economics. And the whole business about economic growth, tax cuts do not necessarily produce economic growth. If you look at Germany, for example, it has much higher corporation tax than we have. And indeed, even with the rises that are in the pipeline. And yet their economy is not tanking in the way that ours is tanking. So I think this, is, this question of balancing the books is really fundamental. Sound bites or sound economics? Well, we, we have lower levels of debt than countries like the US, Canada and Japan. So it's simply not true to say that we have particularly high national debt at the moment. But what I do know is that families across the country are struggling to pay their bills. And what I would do is help relieve... 15% interest rates, Liz. I remember those days. I had to pay a mortgage of 15%. Are we going back to that level again? No, because we've got an independent Bank of England that make decisions about interest rates. And we're, we're, we're nowhere near uh, that, that position at all. But to say that we're going to put up taxes to the highest level and beyond the highest level in 70 years, and we think there will be no consequences for economic growth, I'm afraid I think that's wrong. And I speak to lots of companies, lots of businesses who are very concerned about the proposals to raise corporation tax. They're very concerned about the level of interest rates. They're very concerned about the regulations on their businesses at the moment. The fact is that Britain has got less competitive relative to other countries. Under these corporation tax proposals, we would have corporation tax that is 10 points higher than Ireland. Yeah. And it will make us less competitive. And Germany? And you don't get... Germany? Well, Germany has a very, very different economic system from the UK. OK. Let, uh, we've got one time for one more question. Tom from Gateshead. Where's Tom? We'll come back okay. to other questions. Tom, hi. Sorry. Hi, thanks very much. Liz, why did you announce a well-researched and fully-costed policy in which you openly said you valued the work of teachers, nurses and police officers in Newcastle, where I work, less than you value those in Guildford, for example? We're having this election because of poor judgment and trust. Why should we trust your judgment? Well, the reason that I immediately decided not to pursue that policy is it was being misinterpreted, in fact, in exactly the way you said, because it wasn't about teachers or nurses or doctors. And immediately, as there were concerns expressed about this policy, I said, we're not going ahead with it. And I do think, in politics, there are times when you have to make judgments about what is right and you have to be honest with the public. And I was very honest about the situation. It wasn't a core part of my policy plank, but I'd rather be up front and, if there's a problem, make a decision and deal it with it straight away. And I think you can see, in my time as Foreign Secretary, in my time as Trade Secretary, 
I've been completely upfront about everything I've done. I've explained why I've done it. I've explained when there is a change, why there is a change. And that's the approach I would take as Prime Minister. So, uh, the press release didn't say that. It said that it would be... Um, it, it in order to reach the 8.8 .8 billion in savings, that it would be expanded out beyond civil service, uh, be beyond the civil service itself. Um, so that's a mistake. Will you apologise? Because it was actually quite offensive. Well, I have been very clear that I will not go ahead with this policy, and that I have made a decision to do that straight away. And I've been upfront about that. Okay. I don't think there is anything to be ashamed of of saying publicly that. This is not working as I wanted it to work, and therefore I have changed the position on it, and I'm not going ahead with it. Okay, okay. this gentleman had a view on that. Just wait for your microphone, sir. Can we just get a microphone down here? Thank you. You were shaking your head, sir. I did, yeah. I'm, I hate this um, apologise, you know, for everything that you might have said. I just don't really don't understand it. The, the opposition are always asking, uh, other politicians to apologise for what they may or may not have done. Uh, and it really doesn't sit well with me. When somebody's yeah. asking for your vote, you don't expect to be offended? Well... <laughs> Simple as that. What's that supposed to mean? You know, well, you, I won't intrude on this. My point but, you was... Know, if, yeah. have done. We, we are going into very, very difficult times as a country. Yeah. And we've just talked about that. And we need somebody leading this country who is prepared to make decisions, who is prepared to deal with issues as they arise, okay. and is prepared to be up front with the public. Okay. And I think I've demonstrated that in everything I've done, in all of the jobs I've held okay. during this campaign. Okay.